In this video, we are going to study the articulated foot or the skeleton of foot. Articulated foot is made up of seven tarsal bones, five metatarsals, and fourteen phalanges. So it is made up of twenty-six bones. Beginning with the tarsal bones and their identification, the tarsal bones are arranged in two rows. the talus and calcaneus in the proximal row cuboid and the three cuneiform constitute the distal row and the navicular bone lies in between the two rows each tarsal bone is roughly cuboidal in shape having six surfaces now let's see the individual tarsal bones beginning with the calcaneus it is the largest and strongest tarsal bone it is the first tarsal bone to ossify its medial surface shows a shelf like projection called the substanticulum talli the superior surface of this projection has a facet for talus and forms the talo calcaneo navicular joint now next going to the second bone that is the talus it is the second largest tarsal bone the peculiarity of this bone is that it is not having any muscular attachment and it participates in three joints that is the ankle joint talo calcaneal and the talo calcaneo navicular joint when we see its plantar surface it is marked by a deep groove termed as the sulcus talli it opposes the sulcus calcinea of the calcaneus to form the sinus tarsi on its posterior surface it presents two tubercles medial and lateral tubercles the lateral tubercle is called the os trigonium which can present as a separate bone the os trigonus is one of the example of atavastic epiphysis so applied aspect related to talus in case of fracture of talus it can lead to a vascular necrosis as the artery supplying the talus enters its neck and the blood flows mainly backwards the os trigonum if present may be confused with the fracture of talus it is usually identified by its position now the navicular bone it is identified on the basis of the deep concavity on its proximal surface which articulates with the talar head the cuboid the name of this bone is derived mainly from its shape which is approximately cubical now the cuneiform there are three cuneiform three in number medial intermediate and the lateral the medial cuneiform is the largest whereas the intermediate is the smallest now we'll see the metatarsal bones there are five metatarsal bones which constitute the metatarsus they are numbered from medial to lateral so the metatarsal along the great toe is the first metatarsal and the metatarsal along the first along the little toe is the fifth metatarsal so when we see a individual metatarsal bone the features of the metatarsal bone the head and the shaft are flattened from side to side the shaft tapers distally the dorsal surface of the shaft is uniformly convex the base appears to be cut sharply and obliquely now when you see the five metatarsal bones the first metatarsal bone is the shortest and the thickest 
its proximal surface on its base possesses a kidney shaped articular surface whereas the fifth metatarsal its lateral aspect of the base projects proximally to form the styloid process now the fracture of the base of fifth metatarsal is common it is due to the inversion injury and it is also called as the jones fracture now the phalanges the total number of phalanges in each foot is 14 so all the phalanges are not seen in this specimen so the greater toe has got only two phalanges whereas the rest of the four toes will have three phalanges which will have the proximal middle and the distal phalange now we'll see the arches of foot now we'll go to the arches of foot the arched foot is distinctive feature of man the arches are present right from birth although marks masked in infants by the excessive amount of the fat in their sole arches of foot help in walking running and jumping in addition these help in weight bearing and in providing upright posture they also act as a shock absorber concavity of this arches protect the soft tissues of the sole against pressure now the arches of the foot are classified as longitudinal arch and the transverse arch so the longitudinal arches are the medial longitudinal arch and the lateral longitudinal arch and two transverse arches that is the anterior transverse arch and the posterior transverse arch first beginning with the medial longitudinal arch it is higher more mobile and resilient it has the anterior end which is formed by the heads of the first second and third metatarsal bones posterior end is formed by the medial tubercle of the calcaneum the summit is formed by the superior articular surface of the body of talus the pillars anteriorly it is long and weak and formed mainly by the talus navicular bone and the three cuneiform bones posteriorly it is short and strong and it is formed by the medial part of the calcaneum the joint of this longitudinal arch is the talo calcaneo navicular joint now we'll see the lateral longitudinal arch this arch is much lower compared to the medial longitudinal arch and has a limited mobility it transmits the weight and thrust to the ground the ends of this arch anteriorly it is formed by the heads of fourth and fifth metatarsal bones and posterior end is by the lateral tubercle of the calcaneum the summit is at the level of the articular facet on the superior surface of the calcaneum at the level of the subtalar joint pillars the anterior pillar is long and weak and it is formed by the cuboid and by the fourth and fifth metatarsal bones posterior pillar is short and strong and it is formed by the lateral half of the calcaneum the main joint of this arch is the calcaneo cuboid joint now the transverse arches the anterior transverse arch it is complete arch as the head of first and the fifth metatarsal come in contact with the ground whereas the posterior transverse arch it is formed by the greater part of the tarsal bones and the metatarsal 
it is incomplete as only the lateral ends come in contact with the ground and forms a half dome this posterior transverse arch is completed by the similar half dome of the opposite side now the factors maintaining the arches are the bony factors mainly the shape of the bones then the intersegmental ties that is the ligaments uniting the bones spring ligament in case of the medial longitudinal liga arch the lateral and the medial plantar ligaments for the lateral longitudinal arch and the interosseae for the transverse arch tie beams the arches are prevented by flattening by the tie beams the longitudinal arches are held by the plantar aponeurosis and the first layer of the muscles of the sole whereas the transverse arch is held by the adductor hallucis muscle the slings slings maintain the arches in position so the medial longitudinal arch is pulled upwards by the tendons passing from the posterior compartment of the leg into the sole whereas the lateral longitudinal arch is held by the tendons of the peroneus longus and the peroneus brevis the tendon of the peroneus longus traverses the foot transversely and maintains the transverse arch now the applied aspect related to the arches when there is absence or collapse of this arches it leads to flat foot it is called as the pes planus it can be congenital or acquired same way when there is exaggeration of this longitudinal arches of the foot it is called as the pes cavus it is usually due to the result of the contracture at the transverse tarsal joints now we'll continue with the joints of the foot the joints of the foot are numerous they can be classified as the intertarsal joints tarso metatarsal joints the intermetatarsal joints metatarso phalangeal joints and the interphalangeal joints so the main intertarsal joints are the subtalar or the talocalcaneal joint the talocalcaneo navicular joint and the calcaneo cuboid joint smaller intertarsal joints include the cuneo navicular joint cuboido navicular joint intercuneiform joint and the cuneo cuboid joints so the axis of the lower limb passes through the second toe so the toes are adducted and abducted with the reference to the second toe so when we see the movements at these joints the intertarsal tarso metatarsal and the intermetatarsal joints permit gliding and rotatory movements which jointly bring about the inversion and eversion supination and pronation of the foot the metatarso phalangeal joints permit the flexion extension adduction and abduction of the toes the interphalangeal joints are of hinge variety and permit flexion and extension of the distal phalanges now the subtalar or the or the talocalcaneal joint there are two joints in this subtalar part that is the posterior and, and the anterior the posterior joint is named as the talocalcaneal joint so the talocalcaneal joint is a plain synovial type of joint variety and the joint participates in the movements of inversion and eversion of the foot 
the anterior part or the anterior joint is the talocalcaneonavicular joint and it shows the features of the ball and socket type of joint the movements permitted at this joint are the inversion and eversion calcaneo cuboid joint is a saddle type of joint whereas the transverse tarsal or the mid tarsal joint this includes the calcaneo cuboid and the talonavicular joint it helps in inversion and eversion of the foot we'll see the applied aspect related to the joints the hallux valgus due to ill fitting shoes great toe gets pushed laterally even dislocating the sesamoid bone so the head of the first metatarsal bone points medially and the adventitious bursa develops there so the toes may be deformed at their joints resulting in claw toe so this completes about brief description about the articulated foot